Hello this morning. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? I hope you can. Um, so we're ready to kick off. I'm going to do a bit of a warm-up presentation. I'm Simon Woodward. I'm the chairman of the UK District Energy Association. And this morning we'll be hearing from four of our members about the latest innovations that they're bringing to the sector. So just a very quick warm-up and allow people to take their seats. So a bit about introduction to us and some member benefits. So who are we? Uh, we're the largest voice for district energy in the UK. We have 150 members and we have a network of over 500 different individuals within the sector. Um, across the member segmentation, we've got uh, both manufacturers, equipment suppliers, so people who uh, supply equipment to the sector, but also those people who um, create schemes as well. And that's roughly a 50-50 split across the sector. What do we do as well for members? Well, we sell each of our members a, a monthly journal. It's about 50 to 60 pages, and it's basically about what's going on in the sector each month. And it's an opportunity for you to show to other members what you're doing and what about creating that virtual network uh, that we all operate in. We've also got a website. It's the hub for the association. We've got information on what each member does to promote them. We've got details of events. We run a number of webinars. We've got a document library behind a wall that's accessible by mem to, to members. We've got the jobs board where you can advertise uh, jobs for free that are uh, available in your organization. And we've also got the trading register. So member meetings and contacts with Bayes. So we publish a lot of information. And quite often, some of our members feel it's a bit information overload because there is so much going on in the sector. So a good way to get a detailed, bite-sized chunk of what that is is to have a meeting with one of the members of staff of the UKDA. Uh, we meet monthly uh, and often weekly with officials from the Energy Security and Net Zero Department, newly formed, and we're actually sharing the uh, UKDA lounge with uh, Energy Zero and Net uh, Energy Security and Net Zero just over there. So please do come and say hello. Um, the quote at the bottom I've added on because I was, we, we went out to members for attestations recently, and this has come from Jody Pittaway. So Jody runs one of the largest district heating businesses in, in the country. So he's from Scottish and Southern. And as you can see there, he says, we find UKDEA to be an extremely effective advocate for heat networks. UKDEA is a respected voice in government and has a tried and tested approach to translating members' needs and views into direct policy advocacy. And I think that's the important thing. We understand what you're doing. We come from a heat network development background. So we're not some sort of policy people who don't understand how to create heat networks at the core of the UKDA is people who have created networks themselves. Webinars, we run a lot of webinars. I won't go into all of them. Uh, most of them are now CPD certified. We try and run webinars that both inform the sector, so they're open to members and non-members, but also create stimulating discussions. So you'll see one of the bottom ones was Ambient Luth versus Fourth Generation Heat Networks. Quite a contentious topic, uh, very lively discussion. We typically have over 200 delegates. And one of our next webinars will actually be about whether people should treat their water with chemicals or without, because there seems to be quite a divide in the sector as to which is the right or the wrong answer. We have in-person events. We're here today. Come over and say hello. Uh, we'll also be holding an actual in-person conference in London later in the spring. We've got a training register. Uh, it's on our website. Download it. 25 members have offered 100 courses on various topics. Most of them are free. We have the jobs board, so if you're a member, you can post a job for free, save on some agency fees. And we have, finally, uh, we're just launching UKDA podcasts and awards. So we've just recorded our first podcast, which is about members' benefits, to test it and trial it. And after that, we'll be asking members to come forward and talk about interesting topics that are important to them. And then finally, at the annual conference this year, we'll be launching our first ever UKDA awards. So that's quite enough for me. I'm uh, Simon Woodward, so some details there about how much it is to join the association. It's dirt cheap, to be honest with you. You spend that on a, I expect most heads of business development spend that on a good night out, don't they? Uh, anyway, if you want to find out more, that's me. I'm chairman. You can email me, or there's my mobile number. Give me a call. Uh, that's enough for me. I'll pass you over to the first of our four members. Uh, so this is Steve. Steve's from Rehow, Steve Richmond. And Steve will be talking about the innovation that uh, Rehow are bringing to the market. Apologies that we don't, you can take that down, Steve, don't worry. Uh, apologies that we haven't managed to stitch all our presentations together, so I'll do a bit of a continuous warm-up while Steve's just setting his up. Um, 
a really, really important thing. If you're not aware, it was a hot topic we were talking about yesterday in all the presentations, heat network zoning. If you don't know what heat network zoning is, you should. So please come over to our stand and chat to us more about that. Over to Steve. Good morning, everyone. Firstly, thank you to the UKDA for the opportunity to present today. So my name is Steve Richmond. I'm the head of marketing and technical for Ray Health Building Solutions Division. And I'm going to talk about a shroud revolution that is coming. So the Ray Health Group, we're a German polymer manufacturer of over 20,000 employees worldwide, covering a huge range of sectors, everything from medical products to auto, um, bumpers for Audi, BMW, to PVC windows, to edge band for furniture, but also things what I get involved in underfloor heating, plumbing, and district heating. So what do Ray Hell know about district heating? We're the UK market leader in polymer district heating pipes. We have specialist sales and technical teams across the UK and Ireland. We're also the only UK manufacturer of PEXA district heating pipes. We've been doing that since uh, over 10 years now, had a 10 year anniversary. And also we have the largest stock of district heating pipes in the UK. You can see from that picture, that's our warehouse in Manchester. Also that's a key part of offering that first class service to our customers having that stock on the ground in the UK. So shrouds in the market, what are the available options? On the top left and top right, you've got typical heat shrink shrouds, which are a casing pipe, slightly larger down to over the pipe. And then it's two heat shrinks either side forms that watertight bond. On the top right, it's a similar process where you've got the actual casing pipe is, has the heat shrink inside it. So that's quite a common, it's also used on steel pipes, these heat shrinks. Then on the bottom right corner, you have um, clip shrouds, which are what we've been selling for over 10 years. The difference to those is they don't have heat shrinks. It's two shells put together and then clamped. And then there's also various other shrouds on the market which use sort of lower quality foaming, sort of rock wall or loose um, foam layers. So as always, as you expect from a manufacturer like ourselves, we've been listening to market feedback over the last few years and how we can improve on our shroud options. Hi. Okay. So we listen to specialist dish heating designers and dish heating contractors. And we come up with Clip, Clip Flex, which is the best shroud we've ever built. And I'm going to come on to the reasons why. So firstly, the simple things, it's available in T, I, and L. That's the shapes as you can see there. And in, in small and large, there's six variants of the Clipflex shroud. The most important benefit I see is the flexibility of 22.5 degrees in all directions. So that's not just ho on a horizontal plane, that's on the vertical plane as well. And when you're in a trench with these pipes, it doesn't always get perfectly lined up. So most shrouds and market have zero flexibility. So having that flexibility on site for all directions, you can see in the picture there how important that can be to ease the installation. It's also got a much larger inner space inside the shroud. So having a bigger inner space gives you the ability to fit larger fittings inside it, which means we can use um, things like Fusopex Electrofusion, some of the T's which we couldn't previously use. We also can use modular T's up to 110 mil across e every size range. And I'm going to show some examples how that can save money. So if we'd had a project today of 160 mil equal T, so 160, 160, 160, what we do, we have a pre-insulated steel T, as you can see in that picture there, which is a prefabricated custom part. At each end of that T, you need three eye shrouds to do it. So a flow and return, that'd be six shrouds you need to do in total. With clip flex going forwards, you would need one large clip flex shroud, T large, and you need a fuse apex T. So you've gone from using custom articles, custom prefabricated articles, to standard off-the-shelf articles. Standard articles mean lower cost and shorter lead times. So obviously, flow and return, you'd have two shrouds, but it seems as one. So instead of doing six eye shrouds, you do two of these shrouds. Another example here is for a 160 mil bend in a trench. A 160 is, is a 12 meter stick, so you might need to do a sharp bend in a trench. You'd have um, two eye couplers at the end of that prefabricated bend and you need then two eye shrouds to connect that bend to the individual pipes. In the future you can put that all in one T shroud, sorry, L shroud large and a Fusopex elbow. So again using standard parts and that means lower cost and shorter lead times. 
It's also completely universal with all Ray House pipes. So previously, our largest pipes are 160 mil pecs had to use a separate shroud solution. This can now all fit in the, the same shroud solution. So up to 250 mil outer diameter. And also with our products, we've got two products called Rari Firm and Rari Firmix. Both of them can go in the new clip flex shroud. As previously, we had to use a heat shrink for Rari Firm and Rari Firmix used a clip shroud. So we're actually having that, you can really mix and match hybrid with our two pipe groups. We're also using tried and tested technology. So our clip shroud has been available for over 10 years. As I said, it's two shells put together and then the, the, the orange clamps bring it together and that's something that's tested. The benefit of that over heat shrinks is no hot works on site. And hot works on site is obviously with health and safety, so it, it takes time as well. So you're speeding up that whole installation process. Another thing we change is currently you'd have to buy an individual ceiling ring for every pipe outer diameter on a shroud. So for a, a T-shroud, you buy three ceiling rings for each of them each of the pipes. In the future, it's integrated as part of the shroud covering all sizes, so you don't need to order individual ceiling rings. We've also improved the logistics, so it's 30% smaller, the packaging of the Clipfex, because it's all sort of inverted, the ceiling rings are inside the actual T itself, so you then expand it out on the site. So obviously that'll help for wholesale stock in it, delivery, less space than the lorry needed. We've also changed the phone system. Currently we have a, a foam A and foam B components which are mixed on site and poured into the shroud. We've now gone for a, cat, a 2K P polyurethane, so it's still using the same high quality foam, which is a can that's mixed together the two components within the can and then sprayed in with a nozzle, as you can see in that picture, that light green foam going in. So that's polyurethane foam. The benefit of that is only one article needed rather than lots of different sizes. So if you have a 125-63-75T, just a quite a common T, you, currently you'd use a clip shroud large and then the three different ceiling rings. In the future, you just need one clip flex large and no ceiling rings because it's all built into the system. So it's much simpler for ordering and working out what you need. Now we have six foam articles. In the future, we'll just have one article which you buy in multiples because you need a certain amount, might need two for a shroud of this size or three for that size. So again, it's much simpler ordering how you do this going forwards. So to sum up, three, three shapes, two sizes, one masterpiece is a tagline we're using. So it's fully universal across all ray hells and PEX pipes from 90 to 250 mil outer diameters. You've got the superb flexibility of 22.5 degrees across all directions. You've got a bigger inner space to allow you to use fittings you couldn't use previously inside the shroud. And also you've got something that's tried and tested, that clip technology which we've been using for over 10 years. I would bring one here on stand, but it's quite big. But we do have one, a small and large version on our stand over there in L9. And I think, believe questions at the end, Simon? So thank you very much. For Thanks very much, Steve. I'll invite Neil to come up and uh, get his uh, slides set up. Uh, so just while he's doing that, what, what a really interesting and informative presentation from Steve. It's always good to see manufacturers responding to clients' requirements in the marketplace to uh, reduce time for both uh, construction and uh, installation as well. And I think more and more as we move forward, we will see less and less steel pipe being installed as pipe temperatures are reduced um, through... Uh, just a little bit of a technical resolution here. Um, you, uh, the quiz will be how many district heating engineers does it take to sort a presentation out? Hopefully only one. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but thanks very much indeed for coming on this morning. Uh, you'll be hearing in a minute from uh, Neil Parry uh, from Armstrong Fluid Technology. And uh, I'll pass over to Neil. Thank you, and uh, again, I'd start by thanking the UK DEA for the opportunity to come and present to you today. Um, I'm Neil Parry, I work for Armstrong Fluid Technology, and I'm the global head of uh, District Energy, which means this is the first week this year that, that I've actually been in the UK, which is good. Um, so most people know Armstrong from uh, our pumps, 
Uh, that's been our core product for, for many, many years. Um, we have lots of innovative technology built in, such as sensorless control and something that's called best efficiency staging, where we take control of how those pumps come online uh, and we stage them on by their best efficiency rather than what would typically happen with a BMS, where the BMS is going to run one pump to 90, 95% of its power and then bring the second pump in uh, as, as required, that leads to inefficiencies in pumping and we take that staging uh, very, very serious and we test every pump to monitor where its actual best efficiency point is and we run the pumps in that way. So we, do that, we can do that just by the pump um, and then we can move on to integrated controls where we're controlling up to eight pumps from our optimization uh, platform as well. Uh, we can op um, control bypasses, uh, on the network, which is a, a, a very uh, pertinent problem that we seem to see in uh, heat networks. And then we move up to our more sophisticated controllers when if it's a cooling network, we'll actually take control of the chillers as well, uh, cool, water-cooled chillers, uh, and actually optimize their control in line with the pumps. So everything is operating at its highest efficiency. We're not taking away from the BMS, we're just adding that optimization in based on temperature. Uh, and then we come up to our package systems, which is really what I'm going to talk about uh, today, our IFMS, where it's a manifolded pump system, all supplied, ready-made as a package. And then moving on from that to the next level is where we're supplying a completely pre-built uh, plant room straight to site. Um, lots of uh, benefits to, do, uh, to doing that, which I'll come on to later on. But I think for me, if we're going to get to net zero by 2050, which we legally have to do in the UK, um, trying to do this on site, individually building everything together is going to be too slow for that process and we're not actually going to get to, uh, to net zero by 2050. Much better to take, if you like, the production, car production line approach where these plant rooms are coming off, uh, off a, a, a production line and then just being dropped in at site as and when you need them. So, um, yeah, there's some physics here, back to school, um, but as we know, energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can only be uh, transferred from one place to another or, or changed in its, in, in its uh, type. Um, so that movement of energy should be our focus uh, uh, of our attention, really, and energy is just the ability to do work. Um, so the first hierarchy of importance, if I word it that way, is to reduce uh, our energy use as much as possible. Um, now, secondly, any energy that is used needs to be utilized as much as possible, and we need to reduce that, that waste. And that's into where you start looking at optimization and heat losses on networks and, uh, and so on, and reducing bypasses and bypass flow rates, all that kind of stuff, all uh, is captured underneath that, that, uh, that banner. And then that brings me on to um, wasting energy. Uh, there's very close to where we are now is data center uh, exhibition. Well, now data centers um, need a lot of energy to cool, uh, the, the servers down and generally that, en that heat energy is wasted to atmosphere and that energy should be utilized and put into the district heating network um, you know, to, so it's not wasted. I've just focused on data centers because they're close by but also of course what about wastewater, um, what about processes uh, and so on and so forth. So that, that's what brings us then on to something that's referred to as sector coupling, which is where the different industry sectors and commercial buildings and domestic buildings are all uh, connected together on a web of energy, which we'll look at a little bit later on. That is sector coupling. But the important point is that district energy, whether it's district heating or district cooling, is the facilitator for that process and the facilitator for sector coupling. Completely energy source agnostic, and you can then tailor the energy source based on the geography of where your project happens to be. So you may have a building that can't uh, utilize waste heat, but if it's on a heat network, there may be parts of the network where that waste heat is readily available and can be used and utilized. So uh, thanks to SWEP for this picture. This has just given you quite a, a, a top level pictorial view of what sector coupling actually is. And it's where um, both the heating and cooling networks are connected together. You have various different uh, energy sources in, in, in play at uh, any one time and energy is flowing all around this network. And you can see here, I've put a, there's a data center in the middle that's actually taking uh, the cooling to, to cool, but then that, that waste heat 
uh, from that cooling process is then put back into the heating network to utilize it. And one of the objections I hear on a regular basis to uh, renewable energy is, well, you know, if we're looking at wind turbines, the wind doesn't blow all the time and the sun doesn't shine if we're looking at solar. Well, that's where uh, this really starts to play, uh, play in here because you have the four sectors where you have the power system, which is electrical, uh, electrical energy, gas, which can be a combination of hydrogen, uh, natural gas, biogas, district heating, district cooling. And if we look at wind, for instance, we can see here wind is putting electricity into the electrical grid. Now, at times of, of low demand, that excess electricity can be used as an example for uh, hydroelectric storage, so pumping water uphill ready to release at times of high demand. But also that electricity, for instance, could be used by an electric boiler that's going to create uh, LTHW that's going to be sent into the district heating network because the, there may be a demand here. Or we can use it in an absorption heat pump to provide cooling. So hopefully you can see how all these different things interact and how the energy is moving around this system. Um, uh, between sources, between where it's stored, how it's converted and end use. And most people are obviously familiar with the source, familiar with end users, but it's this storage and conversion phase where all the, the opportunities are. Uh, and obviously, uh, from purely from an Armstrong point of view, lots of opportunities here for uh, fluid flow, thermal transfer, uh, etc. So um, I've got a couple of uh, schematics here. This is based around the uh, SIBSI uh, CP1 uh, support document, their design guide, uh, and this is really how we, we tend to recommend that the plant rooms are, are designed, and our, our typical package plant room will be around uh, the, this sort of schematic layout. Now, we do do engineered to order, where if a consultant has a particular design that he wants to do, we can do that as well, but we try and push to this approach here. Uh, because this is really uh, delta T optimized, and anyone who's in heat networks or district heating know that, knows that uh, delta T is the critical aspect in getting these systems efficient. So what we're doing here is, uh, by connecting the thermal store in a two-pipe arrangement, this is bi-directional, we don't allow flow to go right through and circulate around because that raises the return temperature to your energy sources. So what we're doing here is literally uh, we're creating that stratification or holding stratification in that thermal store. And we monitor that by temperature probes down the side of the thermal store. And what we'll do is bring on and off the heat sources based on where that stratification layer is and its direction of travel. So as an example, if that stratification layer is moving down in the vessel, we know that our output here is greater than our demand on this side of the, the network. So what, what we would do then is probably take one of the sources off. And if it is a mix of sources where maybe we've got some peaking plant that may be uh, fossil uh, fueled, then we'd take that off straight away. And in the same way, as that stratification layer reverses, because the output here is now less than what the demand is on the network, we will then um, you know, bring another source on to make sure we're supplying. But the whole thing is controlled by the stratification layer uh, in that store. Moving on, this is uh, a project that we're working on with a consultant uh, currently. Um, what they're doing on this side, we have a uh, waste, uh, waste heat from a data center. And this is a district energy project. And we're taking that return temperature. We're increasing it using a, wa a water source heat pump and putting that into the district energy network or the district heating network. And we have some uh, m method here of um, basically balancing the demands across the two different industries. Um, this is uh, one of our package plant rooms. As you see, we do 3D renders once we've designed it. This is laid out in our typical way. It's modular in terms of the number of uh, energy sources and type that we can supply in there. So we, we, we can do sort of up to six energy sources in a single uh, plant room, but the plant room itself is modular. So as your district energy network grows organically, as more buildings are added on, we can actually just slot in another uh, energy center and connect the two up and it grows along with your, your network. Lots of advantages to that, of course. Um, we're reducing risk, we're reducing time on site, we're increasing the standardization, reducing the pen potential for leaks and problems, uh, and everything is very repetitive uh, and, and to a known, known design. Really reduces delays in the uh, procurement process and speeds up uh, the, the project. Um, 
Okay, everything, oh, the, the actual energy sensors, they're all tested before they go out, so you're removing that, that, uh, that risk uh, before they go. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, this is the way the, to get to net zero. It's by having a standard packaged item. You can imagine how long it'd take you to build a car on your drive out of spare parts, but that's effectively what we're doing at the plant room at the moment. So we need to standardize that, productionize a plant room completely, and then supply them out to site to get hit net zero. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed to uh, Steve Perry there from uh, Armstrong's who uh, gave us a run through their uh, package plant room solutions. Um, we'll be hearing in a moment from uh, Krista. Krista's from SWEP, they're also exhibiting. Um, SWEP make uh, plate heat exchangers which are widely used across the sector. And uh, I think SWEP's managed, Krista's managed to sort the PR, so there we go. Okay, my name is Christa Fremfeldt, I come in from SWIP, I'm Business Development Manager, and uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I will talk about heat exchanger for heat pumps, okay? You hear me well? Uh, first, a slide about our company. We are about 40 years old. 40 years ago, six pioneers started a company in a garage. Uh, there were six people, we are now 1,200. So we have an R&D center we call the garage to dedicate these pioneers. We are braced plate heat exchanger. We are a manufacturer and we are very much competing with a more traditional uh, bolted and uh, welded challenge tube. What is a heat exchanger? A heat exchanger is a quite simple product. You have a starting plate, an end plant, corrugated channel plate where the heat transfer is taking place and some connections. Put it together into a furnace 1200 degrees and you have a heat exchanger. The flow principle is quite simple as well. You have a warm side and a cold side. And it's a heater, cooler, evaporator, condenser, superheater, depending on the application. But you can't imagine how many variants you can make out of this. What you have up here is typically heat interface unit, units, heat pump units, substation and energy center up to 10 megawatts. Quite substantial range of product. And I don't have to talk about this picture. He has already done it, but a heat exchange that comes in in more or less all applications. Data center, uh, combined heat and power, thermal storage, renewable heat pumps, whatever. This is our uh, heat pump technology roadmap we are working after. I will talk about hyperplane, double walls, next generation condenser, distribution evolution, Celix, and new generation of asymmetric. But first, refresh your mind a little bit about what is a heat pump cycle. It's mainly four components, a compressor, an expansion valve, and two heat exchanger, one condenser and one evaporator. If we look more into detail, condenser is gas coming in, condensing and leaving heat and coming out subcooled. Evaporator, a mixture of gas and liquid comes in and evaporate and it comes out in gas. That is a heat pump cycle. Uh, this is our range and we have two new players coming in to the family. I will talk about the first one here. It's FI22. It's a new special design heat pump condenser for the new refrigerant with a special distribution system, high efficient, and so on. Before we talk about the double wall, maybe I can tell you a little bit what the double wall is. You have a single plate in the heat exchanger. Double wall means you put two plates together and you have a leakage path in the middle. So if you have a crack in the plate, it leaks out and not get contaminated or mixed with the other. It could be tap water, refrigerant, or different types of oils that can't be contaminated with water. That is double wall. And this is our double wall range. This goes into heat pumps, heat interface unit, typical application, and you see the leak detection there. And it's an asymmetric design. Asymmetric means that every second channel has about double size to that one. For example, different flow, different temperatures, different pressure drop requirements. So, a new family in the double wall range. Uh, now we come to the most important part of this presentation, is hyper-twain. 
we go back to our heat pump cycle again. It's two heater changer, but you can also put in a third one. It's called suction gas liquid heater changer, a third one. With Hypertrain, we combine these two. We put that third heater changer into the upper corner of the plate. And if you compare to a conventional uh, uh, evaporator, it takes about 70% of the area for heat transfer and 30% to evaporate the refrigerant out. With Hypertrain, it's only 10% and you have 90% left for heat transfer. Much more efficient. And if you go back to our cycle again, you see the compressor, condenser, evaporator, the condenser letting out the liquid subcooled, going up into the corner of the hypertwain, where you have the suction gas going down, expansion, and meets up here. And uh, this is for heating, and you can run it in reverse mode for cooling as well. As a heat pump and a ref, it's the same thing, but you run it in reverse mode. And now I have a video here to see if it works. Yeah. It works this morning. And you see how the refrigeration is coming in? And now we activate the hypertrain corner here to make sure we subcool the liquid and superheat the gas. Yeah. And finally, uh, a new innovation is the coating we have on our plate. We call it Seekil, Seelix, to prevent uh, corrosion, scaling, leaching, anti-fouling, anti-leaching, anti-scaling. We call it golden plate. You can have a look here later on if you want to. And it's, of course, brass approved, if you are. Typically, tap water application, but other, also other applications within, uh, with dirty media. You can meet me in the stand over there if you would like to talk about heater changer afterwards. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Krista. Um, just while we're waiting for the slides to change, um, I'll step back up and uh, carry on chatting to you. So, um, if you uh, heard my earlier point about the most important thing in the sector is heat network zoning, uh, the second most important thing in the sector is heat network regulation. Uh, it's coming down the path. Um, the government have uh, made it clear that Ofgem will be the heat network regulator, and Ofgem will be taking it over in 2024. Without further ado, I'll pass you on to Carl. Well, thank you, everyone. And again, thanks for Dia for uh, inviting us here in, uh, in this session. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit differently about some of these technical guys that are here and uh, we're new to the, this whole heating and district heating network side but we come from a different background in some respects. Um, but one of the things we do have in common is that where we take heat from and the biggest battery and the biggest heat source we do have is coming from our underground in the, in the subsurface and it's there indefinitely all the time. Um, it's ex inexhaustible energy and it's there forever and w w why this is important is I come from an oil and gas background and spent over 35 years in the dark side of energy uh, producing fossil fuels. Um, however, what we've really t looked at is really gr the ground source heat pump sector is very much, very the s much the same as oil and gas but in a smaller scale. So what we've done is really looked at it in a different perspective and said well what about if we take an oil and gas approach to the ground source heat pump department and look at drilling deeper wells which can produce a lot more energy uh, meaning you use lots less space certainly more expensive but it's a way of actually producing a lot more energy from a from a resource which is there under the ground so what our real goal is is really looking at how can we make that competitive how can we make that really um an anywhere solution um, looking at a monobore type system. So rather than looking at the conventional sort of EGS geothermal solution where you're driving in or drilling into an aquifer or some sort of subsurface hot rock which you have to then permeate to get fluids through, ours is very much still looking at the monobore system or the ground source heat pump solution but looking at deep depth. And we've done a lot of technology sort of innovation around this, looking at existing oil and gas technology. How can we take that from the shelf proven technology and put it in a different aspect? So we all know that the biggest chunk of our decarbonisation, as Niels mentioned, you know, it's a big challenge. We've got this 2050 legal obligation to get there. 
And most people don't realise that actually heat is the biggest source of our energy drive, which was related to heating and cooling. It's the biggest part of one of our energy drives that we have to do. And that really, you know, that's a still pretty staggering number when you look at that globally. So our monoball system is very much focused on doing this in a way which is sustainable uh, without environmental damage. So we're re re really looking at how can we do this without uh, getting into the reservoir in the ground, how do we do this in a closed system which has no environmental impact, no induced seismicity and things like this which geothermal and uh, other things like that do create. So again, our solution is looking at this closed system, fully cased system, but oil and gas magnitude type wells. Um, we're on a stand over there. Um, some of the wells we're looking at drilling may be five, six, seven kilometers deep, but we are looking at power generation from these wells as well as just the heat and cooling aspect of them. So a lot of people don't realize, uh, you know, the general common fault with the uh, perception of geothermal in general is people just think that Iceland and California and places like that is, is suitable for geothermal, and that's absolutely not the case. Uh, everywhere around the world has access to heat. The deeper you drill, the hotter it gets. Some cases have it shallower, some cases have it deeper, but in general, you can make an economic model for geothermal anywhere with the right setup. And it's not always about just plugging in the certain aspects of it, you have to make the setup work. So that's the sort of fundamentals about this. And what makes geothermal or what makes this aspect work better than others is when you start looking at mezzanine effects of energy. So if you start with high temperature, with power, yes, you have to drill deeper, yes, it's more expensive, but you have a high temperature, a high value resource, which is power generation, which is which base load is worth a lot more. The return heat from that, you get a higher temperature, which can then be used for secondary heating or the higher level heating aspects, maybe eight, 70 to 90 degrees. That's industrial process type level heating or large scale district heat networks. Then you have a, a, a sort of lower temperature grade that can also be commercialized, which can then be used for things like agriculture and these sorts of things. So if you mezzanine the process, you actually get a, a multiplier on the return on investment for these types of things. So it's about being innovative and creative with the energy. As Neil mentioned, you know, we've got to get these different things out there and it's about how we adapt, how we use it, plug and play solutions that we can actually put together and make economical in the process. And that's really been our approach, coming from oil and gas. We've got 20 million oil and gas wells around the world and we've got over 2,400 in the UK of which about 680 are still producing. And one of our big approaches is really looking at repurposing these existing oil and gas wells. So we currently have a number of sites over the UK which we've taken on board through collaboration with operators. And these sites will then prove up the, the concept and the process moving forward of how to develop these existing wells and proving up the concept to then develop further wells around them to actually scale up and, and uh, scale this solution. So this is a typical site which we have here. Um, you can see there it's, it's, it's fairly remote, but it's also right on the edge of a major city. And what we can have here is you can see the sort of size of this site. So it's fairly fairly large site. You know, these are sort of 100 meters square normally in, the, in, in general, and a, and a fairly suitable site for development. And on this particular site with existing three wells, we're, we're currently looking at around about a megawatt and a, or half a megawatt to a megawatt per well of energy heat, which is currently in place from the actual wells itself. So that energy is all there. And when you look at three wells, which are already there, three megawatts of thermal energy it doesn't sound a lot, but it's, it's a good starting point for a project to actually sort of kick off and uh, get on board. We've also spent a lot of time in modeling. So we've got a modeling software which enables us to thermally model heat flow uh, laterally horizontally under the ground and that enables us to we've taken this from oil and gas information which is all around the world so we have started to build up a database which is uh, enabling us to really look at the future of what we can do with energy from the subsurface and how it's modeled and there's quite a lot of difference between the previous map that you saw which was from the british geological society which is what is estimated thermal re, uh, gradients based on boreholes that may be 100 meters deep, 200 meters deep, to the reality of when you start getting down to several kilometers, how that changes. It's not always rule of thumb 30 degrees a kilometer. It changes significantly in some cases. A couple of hundred meters down to 500 meters down can be very different. And we have to learn from that and make that um, information a lot more available and better for the industry. 
So this is a typical sort of scenario that we're looking at now. So new housing developments that are being out there where we can build what we call an innovative energy center, which could be a hybrid approach looking at subsurface geothermal for maybe 30 to 40% of the base load power, including all the heating and cooling coming from that and in integrated with rooftop solar uh, on properties with battery storage and then also thermal storage with tanks, etc., and looking at water treatment on the same site. This takes the ability to put these new developments literally off-grid to a point where you can actually be in a location and create an off-grid solution for energy. And again, this is a sort of just a general, general idea. And obviously, this can be scaled multiple ways. So you can have single wells. We would normally put sort of at least two wells into this type of operation. Some of the projects we're looking at maybe up to 16, 20 wells, um, maybe from a minimum of one and a half to two kilometers deep for heating, or up to five or six for including power generation as well. But the idea is, is, is really, it's about how we use the energy, as um, again, Neil mentioned earlier on, it's the use of energy is really important. You know, we don't want to waste energy, we want to make sure, from an oil and gas background that I come from, when you're on an oil and gas platform in the middle of the North Sea or anywhere in the world, you have to reuse everything. You can't emit emissions, so everything has to be captured and reused in that process. All your sewage waste has to be treated, has to be recycled, re reused. All your incinerator waste has to be recycled, be reused. So we're used to coming up with these challenges in the in innovation in the oil and gas industry of how we live remotely and how we need to live in a combined sort of community where everything has to be recycled and reused. And then again, sort of looking at the energy we have, you know, we have this sort of, we have a huge amount of potential renewable energy available to us, um, but we don't have a lot of baseload renewable energy. Uh, and I'm not going to slate nuclear, because I think nuclear is a, everything plays in the mix, and oil and gas will still play in the mix for many, many decades to come. But it's still not really a clean solution. So really, the only way to really look at the future of clean energy has to be looking at the subsurface for baseload energy because wind and solar won't give us that um, process for continual baseload energy and things like battery storage over time these are going to become a lot more expensive a lot more hard to get because of rare earth metals and all this sort of stuff so we have to be looking at really where a baseload energy can play a bigger uh, play in this moving forward and like everything else the more we do of it the cheaper it'll get in, in the process and our, our business is really trying to provide energy to a point which then enables lots of these suppliers and contractors here to actually then become part of that integrated process so we're an energy business we've set ourselves up to be a developer of energy and incorporate um, a lot of the services and infrastructure and the technologies and the supply chain which are at these type of events in, in this process. So we encourage like a lot of these companies here to come and speak to us because we are looking for partners and collaborators in this process. And again, I think, again, from my bias point of view, I think I like that picture there a lot better than the other two, um, basically on how we're going to be uh, seeing our future with renewables if we're... Um, moving forward. I think uh, we have to be very conscious of um, the space we have, the land we have, and uh, the use of that land. And the subsurface enables us to take energy and also keep very much that energy under the ground and still keep a very small footprint of an energy center on the surface. And that's all from me. Super, thanks very much indeed, Carl. Um, if I'd like to invite all the speakers to come and take a chair up the front. Um, we've got time for about one or two questions. Uh, one question? No, I think we're getting the shutdown uh, call from the back. So uh, it's uh, Steve, Krista, Carl and Neil. Uh, they're all on stands at the show, so please do come and find them. And thanks very much indeed. And one final round of applause for our speakers. Thanks very much indeed. Thank